Welcome back to That Rugby Podcast with myself, Luke, and my co-host, co-host Husey. Husey, how are we? I'm I'm good. I'm good. You know, bittersweet week for Waratahs fans for a couple of different reasons, but, uh, you know, we're in the finals, so can't complain. After yeah. the start of the season, that's a that's a good effort. Yeah, you had your place secured, and as, as much as mm. it would have been nice to send off Captain Hoops off with a win from... Um, Sydney base. It's good to yeah. see Moana Pacifica get a win throughout the season as well. So even yeah. though there was a negative for the Tars, some positives all out. Let's get into that week. Then we're going to run you through the finals and what we mm-hmm. think is going to happen. So obviously the Blues beat the Highlanders 16-9, to and which pretty much, not really, but pretty much ended the Highlanders season, depending on other results. Yeah. Um, in the end, it mm-hmm. was the Dura who uh, managed to keep them out of it with their um, emphatic yeah. win. But yeah, that was a good effort by the Highlanders, but I felt like that summed yes. up their season. It was mm-hmm. a very much a good effort, but not there. And I'm not actually, enough. Not I'm complete actually, effort. I'm quite glad they missed out. And that's coming from a New Zealand perspective where they had their, their moment last year to make it, where they were a losing record and made it. And we're abysmal and made it. They don't deserve to be abysmal twice and make it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, 100%. So, the, the Dura definitely deserved it more than the Highlanders did. And I would even say the Reds did for, mm. if you look back now, the reason the Reds made the finals is that win over the Chiefs. We, yeah. we constantly said they couldn't beat New Zealand team. They went there and was the only team to beat the Chiefs this season. So that's the reason they're there, whereas the Highlanders unable to do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, Brumbies then ended the Rebel season in emphatic fashion, um, yeah. which I think, as much as I, I was, as everyone knows, a, a big Rebel supporter going into the season, I think it was good for Australia rugby that that occurred because the Brumbies get the home home quarter. Um, yeah. They are going into these finals looking firing after a big one like that. Mm-hmm. Then we had, obviously, the Ndrura beat the Reds, absolutely smashed them, grabbed seventh spot on the ladder, uh, guarantee themselves in a final spot. Uh, so, you know, last year didn't make the finals. This year made the finals. Next year they'll be hosting a final out of formidable Suva. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then yeah. the year after that they're winning the whole comp. Winning the whole comp, exactly. Look, we've got we've got you on the back. We're, the, we're bandwagons now. We've accepted it. We, I mean, how can you not jump on that bandwagon? I can tell you yep, that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Canes, Hurricanes beat a top New Zealand side, which... As that was about all you could take away from that game in the end um, because no one's spots were moving no matter what happened in that yeah. game. Confidence um, booster for the Hurricanes for sure. Ultimately, it doesn't move them on the table. I think even if the Brumbies had lost, unless the Brumbies lost and didn't get a bonus point, then totally. that's the only way the Hurricanes were going to swap with them. Um, so I think even if the Brumbies had lost, they were more, they were, if they were going to lose to the Rebels, they would have still got a bonus point for being within seven points. You'd, you'd imagine so. Totally, so, yeah, ultimately, totally. I think the Hurricanes probably went into this game feeling... I mean, no, they would have gone into this game thinking there's nothing to lose because the Brumbies and Rebels have already played. Yeah. Uh, nothing can happen to their position on the table. So I, I think that sort of showed out a bit. Like they, they maybe seemed a bit looser, I guess, you know, and maybe that's what they the, the attitude they need to have. Um, you know, there's... Um, there's like a spin of pressure on the Hurricanes this season as well. I think especially after the coach has announced that he's walking away, they're having a new coach coming in. You know, Artie is, you know, taking his sabbatical after the World Cup. Like so there's those various pressures on the Hurricanes. I think that's probably had a bit to do with how they've gone this season. And it's not been a bad season by any stretch. It was, you know, they've got a very winnable finals match coming up. But uh, I think pressure being relaxed a little bit, you could see... Um, how well they can can be. And I think the final scoreline isn't reflective of how much they dominated that game of a very late score, like literally last play of the game, two or three minutes into overtime, yep. got the Crusaders that close. And that was at the point where the Hurricanes knew they were winning. So no one's throwing themselves in front of a rampaging uh, Crusader to stop a try when you've got a finals match next weekend. So totally. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Look, I think the Hur- it's, a, it's a bigger result for the Hurricanes than the scoreboard indicates. Yeah. And I think... The way the Hurricanes obviously started the season and they had an easier draw at the start, uh, kind of gave everyone the idea that they were top contenders. But mm. they failed to beat the Chiefs twice, you know, lost to them twice, uh, lost to the Blues, and, mm. you know, hadn't beaten one of those Crusaders Chiefs or Blues up until this point and had hosted mm. the Chiefs and the Blues at home. So this was a big game in terms of saying they can get the job done 
and they got the job done. Um, I still think, yeah, obviously, Mercedes uh, rested a couple of players, a couple, an interesting lineup, um, but nonetheless, you've got to beat what's in front of you, as we always say. Yeah, and that was the first win in the last, I think it was the first win in the last five attempts against New Zealand teams or something like that. So their last five games against New Zealand teams, they'd lost. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me because I think we played the Highlanders early in the season. And then yeah, you, you, your last win against New Zealand, apart from this last week, was the Highlanders in week uh, nine, I want to say. No, week week seven. Week, week seven. seven. Yeah. You beat the Highlanders. Then week eight, you lost to the Chiefs. Week nine, you had off. Week 10, you beat the Brumbies. Week 11, you lost to the Dura. Fortress Suva, so understandable. Then you beat the Pacifica. Then you lost to the Chiefs again. Then you lost to the Blues. Then you lost to the Crusaders, and then then you're back on winning territory in New Zealand. Yeah, so yeah, against the Blues, uh, was, sorry, against the Crusaders. It was one of those games where it was like a tip of the hat, like yes, we can mm. do this as a team. So, look, confidence going into next week for the Canes, but again, that game meant nothing. Just like this game, Moana Pacifica versus the Tars, all oh. it meant was a farewell to to the great hoops. It's, it is the most Michael Hooper game of all time. <laughs> Right, and I'm going to take there's several elements to this. Right, okay. First of all, uh, let down by his teammates. Fantastic individual performance, let down by his teammates. Typical Michael Hooper story. Best player on the field, everyone around him let him down. Right, but as well, right. This is Michael Hooper. He's such a uh, custodian of the game, such a contributor to the game that in his final game at home against the Waratahs. He makes sure that Moana Pacifica has a future by giving them a win. He gives the old mate Christian Leleofano a try as well, right? And he hates the limelight being on himself. So all the news now is about Moana Pacifica getting a win, getting their first win of the season. And Hoops can sort of wander off backstage without too much attention being paid to him because he doesn't like being in front of the camera. He doesn't like being the center of attention. It's the most Michael Hooper thing I can ever imagine. You know, fantastic individual performance, let down by the team, but at the same time, doing the best thing possible for the game of rugby, which is to give Moana Pacifica a win, give them confidence into he- heading into next season, give supporters of the game uh, reason to tune in and watch Moana Pacifica, give r- Super Rugby confidence that Moana Pacifica can be a thing. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just a fantastic. It's a, it's the epitome of, of Michael Hooper, I think, where. He's brought so much to rugby, and he'll he he won't take the personal reward. He'll sacrifice it all for the greater good. So I think it's just the most Michael Hooper thing ever. Congrats, Michael Hooper! You know you did yeah. it, you did the right thing. Now <laughs> a, a couple of, a couple of actual talking points from that game. Yeah. No, Jake Gordon, a real rugby yeah. player. That man is he's a, he's a rugby he's a, player. He's a he's a rugby player, no doubt about it. No, Langan Gleeson, and yeah. there's doubt going into next week. I don't know if they've been ruled out yet, but I, I the headline I read there was doubt around them playing. Now, mm. as as great as Langan Gleeson is, we know how strong you are in that department of the loose yeah. forwards. That rugby player Jake Gordon, that's that's a massive loss going into next it's week, a, yeah. especially since I know we're going to be talking about this later. But Teddy Wilson is across with the Junior Wallabies in New Zealand at the moment. Mm. So you you've got I think it's just Goddard at the moment and then Harrison that Goddard set. yeah so yeah Harrison Goddard I think is the is the is the man there and then there was also the great experiment of Marky Market at fullback Parisi on the wing um, and then uh, Tui uh, yeah Tupolotto went inside and then outside um, Joey Walton and so the Waratahs were like they that's an under fifty percent squad so you think about it Angus Bell has been out since week one right like. Dave Parecki didn't play either. Uh, Jed Holloway didn't play. Langy Gleeson didn't play. Jake Gordon didn't play. Fichetti didn't play. Uh, Jorgensen didn't play. That's, that's I don't even remember how many players I counted. That's seven or eight players right there from your starting lineup that are just not playing. 50% of your starting lineup. You, I, look, with the exception of some of the top teams, uh, in, in some of the top four teams, you take away 50% of any team starting lineup, they're going to struggle. They're going to struggle. And Moana Pacifica, sure, they hadn't won a game all year, but they're close in a lot of their results. And actually, it was very interesting watching the coverage of that game, particularly where they were breaking down the season. I have to say the media coverage was very positive despite the fact they hadn't won a game. And it, it was really educational on the difference between the Dura and Moana Pacifica because the Dura, um, and you, you said this before, had existed in some form or fashion before Super Rugby. They were they're sort of a club 
rugby-esque side, I guess you could say, right? Um, but they had some kind of history. There was a, a squad beforehand. Moana Pacifica, though, is completely out of nowhere. A lot of these players hadn't been professional up until two years ago. Hadn't even been playing at that high of a level. And it's really been a true startup franchise, right? And so, yeah, I think you can cut them a bit of slack um, for the first two years. You know, with these players... You know, it's like a sports movie. You're picking amateurs off the street, basically, and asking them to be professional players. You're getting the old retired guys uh, like Lele Afano in there to give them a bit of mentorship. But yeah, look, they haven't been they haven't been that far off in a lot of their games this season. And when a team is under 50 percent strength, you know, it's it, it, of course it, it was they played really, really well. My one specifically, you could see the pieces are there. I still think I'm, I'm still think their halfback Inari is one of the top halfbacks in the competition. When he came on in that game, the the passes he was giving his players were incredible. It's some of the best service I saw from a halfback all year, and I I, tr- I really think he's gonna. Be a very, he is already a very valuable piece, but I think he should be getting some more attention because of just what a fantastic player he is. Um, and a couple of their wingers that were just amazing as well. Like it was a, a amazing contest. I think the Waratahs muscled up very well, but the execution wasn't there. And look, uh, some of the players they had in replacement of their starters just uh, are not that quality players. Like Hannigan um, and the other second row of the guy that looks like Neville Longbottom. Yeah. Sinclair, yeah. Look, I don't even remember his name. That's how bad they he played, right? Just they're just not it, you know. Um, I will say that Vailanu, the replacement, the the backup hooker or the bench hooker for the Waratahs, is a quality player. He is really impressed me this year, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's a gold jersey not too far in his future because of how well he's been playing and how much we need hookers uh, in in Wallabies colours and to lock him up long term because he's been playing fantastic. He's got an excellent pilfer. It reminds me of uh, one also very small hooker. Uh, named Hughes that has uh, played for Knox Old Boys, who loves a pilfer or two, um, maybe with a bit more hair and a bit darker skin, but you know, essentially the same quads uh, like most people's torsos, you know. Uh, so look, I think he's a quality player that could do a lot of really good stuff for the Wallabies as well. But uh, yeah, I think, and then in the the back line as well, like it, again, it's not that they necessarily play bad, but it's just that they're not as good as the, the guys that are the starters. The, the starters are the starters for a reason. And then when you're playing guys at a position like Parisi on the wing, Nwangani Tawase, a fullback, like it's just a recipe for disaster. And that's really what we, we saw there. The, they had some good moments for the Waratahs, but they dug themselves a hole early that they just couldn't get out of through some poor decision making. And yeah, it's it's trouble signs going into next week, but you, you know, you're going to play, going away to play the Blues. I don't think many people hold much hope for that anyway. Totally. Uh, and then to finish off the round, the... Chiefs spanked the force to end the fourth season where they hadn't lost at home yeah. this season but weren't able to do it against the top-of-the-table team, unfortunately. No, the, the end, Chiefs showed their class, basically. Totally, totally. And the force, I will say, just put put a little highlighter through their name because they've done some serious recruitment already yeah. um, with the players they've picked up for next season. Oh, ben, ben Donaldson is apparently very close to signing, signing with, them with them for next year. And they've Nick inked. White. Did, did they end up inking James O'Connor? Was that confirmed? I don't think they actually confirmed O'Connor. I know they've got yeah. White. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think they got Harry Potter as well from <laughs> Leicester Tigers. So that was a signing. Yeah. Magical signing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't think he's. Yeah, I don't think I'd be it's surprised confirmed if he goes that he's. Now. It's signed. So it's probably between O'Connor and uh, Donaldson. Like they're they're really trying to. I guess they, whoever they can get. Um, on a on a better deal, I guess. But yeah, they've done some. Yeah, they they they'll be a force to be reckoned with. Ah, there you go. Shall we move into looking at the finals, working yes. out some predictions, doing that? So obviously, game one, or we're going to go. Not, I don't know what actually the draw says, but one versus eight, the Chiefs versus the Reds in Hamilton, yep. where we go back to that famous win. Which mm-hmm. I'm calling it a famous one now because it's the only reason the Reds are in the finals. Yeah, is a famous one against the Chiefs where they couldn't beat a New Zealand team if they tried. They now yep. did it. Like, do they have a chance? Does lightning strike twice? No, <laughs> not in the same spot. No, I, 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 I agree as well. I think the, the Chiefs absolutely spanked the Reds, um, yep. especially coming off. I don't think enough people were factored in. The week after a Fijian Duda game in yeah 
in Suva, and especially the way they got spanked there, I just think that rolls into Hamilton and we see the Reds. You know, put up a fight for the first 20 minutes. Fraser McWright will tackle his heart out. Pilfer his heart out. Yeah. Uh, Vuni Valu will do a couple of magical things that no other player on this planet could do, and then they'll lose by 60 points. Yeah. McKenzie, Damien McKenzie, looking like Damon Tug Garen is just going to torch them. He's going to burn them <laughs> up. He will take them out. There's just, yeah. He, I, I, ever since I've, he just did this uh, cheeky smile in a game. And uh, I think it was against the Brumbies. And ever since then, I've just like, he just looks like Matt Smith. I just can't get out of my head. <laughs> I might have to do a lookalike section. Uh, yeah. And then put him in, yeah, put him like. in the Targaryen armor and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, second game in Christchurch, the Crusaders reeling off a loss. Hosts the Nuda baby, um, as Sean Maloney says. Um, mm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shock you here. I bet I th- well, I'm probably going to agree with you if you're going to shock me. I'm going to shock you. I'm going to put the jersey that I'm wearing and I say, this is going to be something special. I think the Druda pull it off. You're, we're on the same page, we're on my the friend. Same page. We're on the same page. The Dura are fired up. They got themselves in the final. They whipped their Queensland Reds. They're rolling into Christchurch. They're facing the Crusaders, who they've already beat this year. They know they can beat them, right? Yes, sure, they beat them in Suva. Right, that doesn't matter though. They're fired up. The Fijian spirit going strong. Right, <laughs> they're gonna, they're gonna. The Crusaders unsuspecting. Right, this is soft time. Oh, easy. We've got the Dura. This is the first time in the finals. Finals footy is different. They don't know what they're in for. Exactly right. They're too young. They're too naive. They don't know that they should be nervous. They don't know that they should be uh, expected to lose. All they know is that they're here and they control their own destiny. Right, and so the Dura are gonna roll into Christchurch, and they're going to roll over the Crusaders. Let's go in this dynasty. You and know, the I last just... game of Razor's career in the red and black is going to be a loss to Fiji. Exactly. What a story. What a yeah. story. The Judah fly in there, yeah. soaring off, uh, coming out of their fortress of Suva, yeah. and they ruin a Crusader dynasty. It's they're just... going to raise the Razor to the ground. Exactly. Yeah. I absolutely love it. We're on the same page. Everyone get yep. on the page. You heard it here first. Up the Dura. Um, Blues versus the Tars. Blues hosting in Auckland. Yep. Um, I'm going to just say my two words. You're going to get spanked. Um, yeah. And I'll let you have the floor. We're going to get spanked. <laughs> We're not healthy, right? Uh, you know, it's just, look, unless... It's gonna be. It's gonna to have to be Hooper. Basically, it's gonna to have to be a superhuman effort once more from Superman himself. Right? His look. Put it all on the line for Hooper. This is it. His swan song. It's gonna take something really, really special to to do to do this. It's gonna to have to be the greatest game all of these players have ever played in their life. Um, but I, I, I don't think they can do it. Just, just brutally honest. As a Waratahs fan, I don't think they can do it. It's just not been there all season. There's flashes. Right, and it's so frustrating because there's flashes of greatness, and then it's just slip ups and mental errors, and it's self imposed damage. And that's the worst part about it is that all the pieces are there for the Waratahs to be great, but they're doing it to themselves, and that is what hurts the most. And I don't think against a quality team like the Blues, uh, they're going to be able to get it done. I think they're just, yeah, they're going to get carved up. Yep, I tend to agree. Uh, the last game, the Brumbies. Host the Hurricanes. Um, Hurricanes coming off the win. Brumby's coming off an even bigger win. Uh, what do you reckon is going to happen in this there's one? A, there's a couple of injuries up in the air for the Brumbies. I think Corey Toole is the, the, the biggest one because he's been the biggest piece for the Brumbies this year. Uh, much like you said about Vunivalu, just able to make something out of nothing. Again, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a gold jersey in his future either. Um, but, and it, but if he's out, I think that really limits their attacking options. Um, and limits the the depth of what they're able to do. Um, I I just don't know because they are they do love playing in Canberra. They beat the Canes there last year in the finals, um, and they ste- they stepped up and exactly the same seeding and everything. Um, I think it's I, this game for me to be totally honest is a coin flip. Yeah, I, I'm actually not too far away because the Hurricanes are missing some key pieces as well. No Julian Savia for the rest of the season. Uh, Duplessis Karifi went down injured before the Crusaders game. Which actually moved Artie to seven, which mm, I, I saw didn't that, mind yeah. because Brand, Braden or Iossi absolutely carved up at number eight. Yeah. Um, so it's not a it's not a tier like we've got we're very similar to you guys with loose forward stock. Um, mm. 
Also, Salisi Reasi is out on the other wing. I know Kenny Nanaholo is absolutely killing it. Had a fantastic game against the Crusaders. But we're, we're, we're missing some pieces as well. So, look, I'm more confident than I was last year looking at our team. Yeah. Uh, looking at Ada Morgan out of the first five. Uh, but to say, like, I'm 51% sitting mm. there back in my boys, like, thinking we can yeah. bring it home. It's it's you've got to go to Canberra. It's never easy to go to Canberra and to come away with a win's a, a big ask mm. against the best Australian Super Rugby team uh, at the moment. Mm. So, look for the competition. The Brumbies probably need to win this. Let's be honest. Um, I think if if, if 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 you say there's a semi finals and the semi finals are the Judah because they've just beat the Crusaders obviously against the Chiefs and the Brumbies against the Blues again. Like, yeah. I'm pretty excited about that. If you take the Canes against the Blues, I'm still excited, obviously, as a Cane supporter and as a New Zealand mm. rugby fan, but I think Australian rugby fans a little bit disappointed there. So, look, for the for the game, I'm willing to pull a Michael Hooper and give up a semi-final spot for the better of the game. But mm. if the Canes win, I'll, I'm obviously obviously going to be ecstatic. But I just yeah. it is, like you said, a coin flip. So, there we go. Well, uh, Interesting. So, yeah, we guarantee a Chiefs Blues win pretty much. We mm. guarantee a Judah win, and then we will see. Lock it in. Lock it in. Put the, put the mortgage, take out a second mortgage and put all the money <laughs> on it. Don't. Please don't. <laughs> Gamble responsibly. Um, yeah. Taking you to a new segment. It's Even called the Coach's Corner. Even when you win, you lose. That's what they say, isn't it? <laughs> the new one, yeah. They've, they, yeah. they've decided that Gamble responsibly wasn't hitting enough, so yeah. they've uh, chucked that one out there. But we've, uh, we've got a new segment, Coach's Corner. <laughs> Uh, where we're going to talk about coaching slash the coaching world slash coaches in the rugby world. Mm -hmm. Two coaches uh, have hit the headlines, I would say. Um, One is Laidlaw, Greg Laidlaw, the sevens coach for New Zealand currently, has taken up the role or accepted the role from next year of Hurricanes head coach um, with Jason Holland moving to the All Blacks. Now, Mm. I... Am ecstatic about this as a Hurricanes yeah. fan. I was going to say you'd be pretty happy with that one. We are already a team who is known for, you know, electric plays, counter attacking, um, throwing the proverbial rugby playbook out the door and doing what suits best. So to get a sevens coach and a very highly regarded sevens coach who's taken the New Zealand sevens to highest of mountains since uh, the great uh, Titchens left. I'm just ecstatic. I'm, I'm so excited to see what he's going to do with the likes of Geordie Barrett, with the likes of a Riasi or a uh, Ruben Love, Aidan Morgan. It's uh, There's a lot to like, and I think it was one of the best signings. We I, I was sitting there wondering who we could sign that would make me this excited. I don't think there's anyone else out there that could have made me this excited. Yeah. So that's the, that, that's the big one for... My coaches, yeah. especially especially after you guys lost out on Dave Rennie because he went to Japan. Like you guys could have had Rennie. We could have, and that was one that was. I again, I think the Blues were more circling him than us, and I think yeah, uh, that was more likely. But he, he was a coach there. However, Dave Rennie's replacement, Eddie Jones, has said some interesting things mm. um, in the past week. I would say, uh, yeah, run us through those, Hughie. So Eddie Jones came out. Uh, the other day and basically said uh i'm trying to remember his 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 words because it was something like um where after this world cup whether we win it or we lose it it's time to go um let me see if i can oh here we go i'm only coaching until this world cup um i've signed it I've signed, but as I've made the mistake before i've stayed too long so we win the world cup it'll be time to go if we lose the world cup it will be time to go Jones has previously spoken about his regret at staying on it as England coach beyond the 2019 World Cup. He's since then clarified. He said, I'm here for five years, but my only concentration is this Rugby World Cup, so I don't think past that. Which is what I think... I think a lot of people are sort of assume that after he said it, but it's probably good that he came out and clarified it. And he's sort of in the mindset of, this World Cup is it. I'm coaching like this is my last gig which is, you know, we've, we've heard athletes and coaches have that before, you know, only concentrate. Uh, the only game that exists is the next game kind of thing, um, you know, taking it one game at a time. So it makes sense. Probably not the best way to have said it, 
as well. Um, but you know, he's making headlines. He's 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 generating news articles. That's what he does. He's a walking headline, Eddie Jones. So it's no surprise. I think when we were chatting before the podcast, I think you said something like you wouldn't be surprised if he'd done it intentionally. And I, I wouldn't be surprised either if that was something he did just to stir the pot a bit, just to give the media that those little crumbs because everything's been all quiet on the Eddie Jones front for a little bit. And that's not what he wants. And that's not what Rugby Australia needs. Rugby Australia needs a lot of uh, a lot of news. There's some other news out of uh, Rugby Australia this week as well, which we don't have on the run sheet, but I wanted to bring up now, and it's a good time to uh, bring it up, is uh, Phil War is going to be the next Rugby Australia CEO. And I think that's uh, a really cool move because no one knows who the fuck the current CEO is. It's a bloke named Andy Marinos, right? And he's done a great job, but nobody knows who he is. Nobody's, nobody's heard of him before. Lots of people heard of Phil War before. Even a lot of people that have sort of gone away from rugby have probably heard of uh, Phil War, one of the greatest uh, back rowers in Australian rugby history, former Wallabies captain as well. Been a part of the board since 2018 and as part of the governing body's rugby committee. So he's had that governance experience as well. I think this is really exciting for Rugby Australia to have now a big name attached to the CEO role because Hamish McLennan has sort of made a name for himself as the Rugby Australia chair, given his uh, comments to Peter Volandis and stuff. So people kind of got an idea who he is now. And now Phil Wars coming in and you've got Eddie Jones. You've got these, a lot of big names there um, making rugby, you know, sort of um, a talking point again, which it hadn't been for a little bit here in Australia. So it's really, uh, it, it's exciting along with the Eddie Jones comments, you know, rugby's getting in the news. It's great. It's great. Yeah, uh, it'll be, Interesting, the Phil War one, and like you said, I'm glad you said you've seen his experience because that would have been my first question. Like, how capable, like a, a great yeah. name, like you said, a great footy player, but how capable was he being a CEO? Like, there's a difference yeah. thing between being a tech engineer and a software, you know, a, a CEO. Like, you can build the software, but you may not be the greatest CEO. You can play yeah. the play the footy, but you may not be the greatest CEO. But it'll be interesting. It's definitely like you said. I'm not. That's not me knocking him because. He played rugby with, I guess, um, a lot of intelligence. Didn't look like the most intelligent player, I'll give him that, but played it with a lot of intelligence. So hopefully that carries over to the CEO. I role. still remember the ads of him hopping in the ice bath, you know? <laughs> that was amazing. And then people grabbing the beers out of the ice bath. It's a great ad. We didn't get those but ones. Like, I, obviously... Yeah, I think he, he knows what it takes to win as a Wallaby. He knows what it takes to be great as a Wallaby. So I'm, I'm excited that he, that I guess, did the. the the previous administration has been about the business of rugby, but and I'm glad it's sort of focusing on the game of rugby because the better the game is, the better the business itself will be. You totally, know, and I think totally. that's a really positive, uh, positive aspect of it all is that the um, the it, it's going to be more about the game and less about the the money, I guess, which is which is exciting because that will, that will naturally bring in the money, right? Instead of trying totally. to figure out how we can get as much money out of this thing as possible, is how can we grow this thing to be the best thing possible, and the money will come from that. Uh, on to the next topic. Now, I've taken a little cheapskate this this week um, because I didn't have a rule prepared for Luke's new rule rugby segment. Yeah. So what did I do? I obviously went to the smartest thing on the planet, which at the moment is ChatGPT, and I went into the II and I said, make me a new rule. Now, funnily enough, the boys who are at West Harbour who know that I do a podcast were having a yarn about my rules and said, when are you actually just going to get rid of the scrum? So shout out to Cam Beefham. But I typed in, and this is what I typed in. I asked it, give me a new rule for the sport of rugby union. And this is what it spat out, okay? I'm just going to read it out because, God, it uses words that I would never come up with. Um, yeah. New rule idea for rugby union. Dynamic scrum engagement. Funnily enough, we're still on the scrum. Yeah. Proposal. Implement a dynamic scrum engagement process to enhance safety and fairness while making, while maintaining the integrative, integrity and competitiveness of the scrum contest in rugby union. Objective, to reduce the risk of injury and ensure a fair and stable platform for scrum engagement, thereby enhancing player safety and promoting a more effective and efficient scrum contest. So here's the rules description. There's a pre-engagement phase. Prior to the referee's crouch command, both packs must align and remain stationary with their front rows no closer than one metre apart. Very similar to currently. The referee ensures that both packs are ready and properly set. 
the engagement phase. The referee gives a crouch command and both teams crouch into position. Again, very similar to what we have already. The referee then gives a bind command and both front rows bind with their opposition counterparts. Once the front rows are browned, the referee signals the terms to engage by giving the engage command. So this is where we get different. Dynamic engagement. Instead of the traditional hit, the traditional when you engage, what we're doing is both teams will push progressively from the crouched position. So rather than the first contact being a hit, it'll be more like that and it'll be a push. All right. So rather than the hit, it's a push. Uh, the referee monitors the engagement, ensuring the scrum remains stable and both teams maintain forward momentum. The scrum half, here we go, and this is another good part of it. The scrum half must feed the ball into the scrum immediately after the engage command to promote a faster and continuous flow of play. Mm. So the scrum, they go in. Yep. Put the ball in the scrum, Nick White. He calls engage. <laughs> he calls engage. You start the push motion and the ball goes in. Yeah. Um, and the benefits from this is obviously enhanced safety by eliminating the forceful impact on engagement. The risk of neck and spinal injuries is reduced, making the scrum safer. It's a fairer contest. The dynamic engagement allows both teams to exert force gradually, reducing the advantage of teams with dominant scrums and providing a more balanced contest. Whereas you can still dominate in the scrum with this, like I think you still have that opportunity. It also has past the ball distribution, the scrum half has to feed the ball in immediately, leading to quicker and more continuous play and reduces collapses, which is a big one. The gradual push from the crouch position reduces the likelihood of a scrum collapse, minimising delays and injuries associated with the collapse scrum. And then I love this part of it. It leaves a note. The rule proposal should be Thoroughly assessed, trialled and refined for extensive consultation with players, coaches, referees and rugby union governing bodies to evaluate effectiveness and potential impact of the game. Couldn't have said it better myself. And a couple more points to finish off. Uh, under 20s rugby, uh, firstly, the English loss to the Georgian team. So the Georgian yes. under 20s beat, and I think it was quite convincing in the end, like 38-20 or something like that. It wasn't like a... A very close game. So a huge statement. Uh, and then that leads on to the Wallabies, or the under-20 Wallabies beating the All Black under-20 Wallabies. We hadn't released our Super Rugby players yet for that first one. So we didn't actually have our full squad. And then in the second game, we had our full squad and we won. So... All right, so the Under-20 World Cup is happening this year. So there's Under-20 World, the Royal Rugby Under-20 Championship and Under-20 Trophy, which are two different competitions. I believe the trophy is the lower tier competition. Um, looks to be yeah, based on the teams it is. Uh, so the World Rugby Under-20 cha- Championship uh, is coming up soon, actually, the 24th of June to the 14th of July in South Africa. And then Kenya will stage the Under-20 Trophy um, from 15th to 30th July. So the under 20 championship features France, Japan, New Zealand, Wales, Australia, England, Fiji, Ireland, Argentina, Georgia, Italy, South Africa in three pools of four teams. And then the trophy features a combined Canadian U S team, Scotland, Uruguay, Zimbabwe, Hong Kong, Ch- Hong Kong, China, Kenya, Samoa, and Spain. Oh, nice. That's cool. I like, the, like that set up. So yeah, <laughs> Our, our teams will collide yet again at the Under Twenties World Cup, hopefully mm-hmm. in the final. We will beat you, and it won't matter about all of these preseason games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, last point for today, I want to touch base on, and I want to get your opinion on this. I'm interested. Origin obviously happening in our competitor in our rugby league. So what I'm thinking now that we've chucked this idea out of like a Six Nations in the Southern Hemisphere or like a, you know, a different Six Nations. What if we played the Bledisloe series during Super Rugby season? So they were three midweek games where you'd have like the bye, just the exact same as Origin. So you'd Mm. have like those bye games and bye rounds that we had to deal with and put up with. And then you'd have on a Wednesday or a Thursday or whatever, and uh, a Bledisloe game, you play the free Bledisloe series now, and then for the Six Nations, it doesn't matter what you do with the Six Nations. Like, that's just put towards the Six Nations at the end of the at the end of the end Super Rugby season. So during the Super Rugby season, we have our own origin style of rugby with the Bledisloe happening. So... Um. 
there's positives and negatives, but I think it takes away. I think I like the current setup as is, uh, because I feel like when Super Rugby season's on, you're still distracted by Super Rugby, right? I think that Origin has has got. It's just. I think there's just some things that don't translate from rugby league to rugby union, even though they are pretty parallel or right? like playing for your state and playing for your, your, your country are pretty well on par there with how big origin is compared to how big Bledisloe is. But I think when you're playing in the super rugby season, I think it's just, I think it's too much to put it to the, to one side. I don't. Yeah. I just, I don't, I don't think it works. I don't think it works. I think the current Bledisloe setup works. Um, and yeah, I think it would just be. I, I don't know if it would translate as well. I just, I just don't know if it would translate as well. And then, as well, because now with Super Rugby, we do have Fiji and Moana Pacifica as well. That's sort of like, okay, well, we're pausing their season for nothing because they're not playing in the in this game. Well, see, that I would, and I would agree with that point. But we had these buy rounds throughout the season, so it wasn't like we paused the season anyway for it. It's not. This is a midweek game. I actually think it's in a benefit. Of one particular in the Jura because they get a whole week so, off basically with all their players they get a whole resting. Week. All Blacks and their Wallabies players are actually having to uh, to double up. Slash, I imagine that would be the time where a lot of the rugby players would, well, the All Blacks or the Wallabies would have their rest weeks the week after type thing like that. Um, I just, I, I think it would work really well to encompass then now like, hey, this is this is the rugby calendar, and again. When yeah. this is on, this is again. It's a separate thing to the rugby championship, or you know, it's not. And then I guess yeah, the, the week before, the, the first week of the rugby championship, you just have Argentina versus South Africa, and no, and no Wallabies New Zealand games in that time. And then second week, you do you know like New Zealand versus Argentina, Australia versus Africa, and then flip. I mean, yeah, I guess it, I guess it could work. I just I don't know if it would translate too well. I just I'm not I'm not sold. I think, yeah, I think with the current setup of the rugby championship, it wouldn't work. I think this would be if we extended it to the Six Nations and they were like, we've got to fit now in a Six Nations yeah. calendar, you know, play everyone's, you know, we'll play five other games. I think it would work better. It'd be like you're pretty much having, because mm. you're going to have to separate that, that comp anyway. So I just see that working better. I wouldn't, yeah, where we currently are with the rugby championship, I wouldn't be doing the setup. It would more have to mm. be with a Six Nations there. Um, so imagine again, say we were to change the calendar and the Six Nations occurred at the start of the year with the other Six Nations, the Northern Hemisphere Six Nations. Then we went into Super Rugby season a little bit later and the Bledisloe happened during that time. I think it could, I think there's a possibility of it being able to work. I'd be interested to see, mm. yeah, if it would take too much away from the Bledisloe or Super Rugby. Like, yeah. And obviously at the moment they can work quite... Well, co-currently with the NRL and State of O, because it gives, it gives players more time to get healthy as well. Totally, it, that it gap was, after the Super Rugby season. It's to, and I get that. That's definitely a point. You see Cam Murray and Nathan Cleary walking injured after trying to back up, uh, and I would imagine both Wallabies and All Blacks would be smarter than that and not make them yeah. back up into rugby. But yeah, it is. It was just an interesting one. I think thinking how could it translate? Could it work? I say it, could, yeah. it definitely could work. It's just. Yeah, it would take the right setup to to make it work and not be a standard. Hundred percent. Uh a big week ahead. Big week of Super Rugby. Um, we will be. I'll be uh, making a spreadsheet for Husey to have a look at for Team of the Week, uh, Year nominations, uh, mm-hmm. some rugby awards that will be coming out and doing some votes with. So make sure you're on our Instagram voting on those. Um, other than that, thank you for joining us this week. I have been Luke. That has been Husey. We will see you again next week. Goodbye. Peace.